retrocausality or retrocausation. Well, let's just talk about what retrocause means. Let's break it down. So retro usually means contrary to the usual or natural course or direction. So like retro clothes are like when you're bringing an older fashion back. <laughs> let's talk about cause. What is cause? Cause is the reason for something. It usually brings about an outcome, a result, or most commonly, an effect. Cause and effect. Now we're used to cause coming before effect, but what happens with retro causality is that cause and effect are in reverse order. And so the future is actually affecting the now. I see a lot of things like this here that I can't prove are retro causality but I know deeply that they are. I just can't prove it to you. But Thomas Edison invented cat videos, y'all. <laughs> yeah, so before the 1900s, there was this good of video in Edison's studio, which was basically his basement, and he would make cats box, and he would do pretty awful things. He wasn't a nice man. And um, I, I have other videos coming on all that, but. I want to talk about my favorite subject, CERN, because there is more evidence to prove retrocausation with CERN. So in 1971, CERN had their first proton on proton collisions, which happened in their ISR, which is short for the intersecting storage rings, which you can see here in this picture. That was in 1971 that they were doing proton proton collisions in that ring. But they very quickly afterwards pretty much stopped doing proton-proton and started doing proton-antiproton or electron-positron, which is an the antimatter particle for an electron. So they started immediately messing with antimatter. They started making it and storing it and using it by hitting it with a laser, tickling it is what they call it, and that then they would collide it with protons. In fact, the very last thing that this article about their proton-on-proton -proton collision was a note that the ISR was shut down in 1984 because CERN shifted its sights to the LEP, the Large Electron-Positron Collider. And positrons, again, are antimatter particles of electrons. So what the LEP is, and I'm about to talk about that in great detail, was their 1980s through the 90s particle collision every day colliding hundreds of billions of particles that was antimatter particles and see where it says new particles yeah they were creating new particles of antimatter and matter but mostly antimatter let's check out what cern says on their website about the antimatter symmetry problem so the Big Bang should have created equal amounts of antimatter and matter in the universe, but today, everything we see from the smallest life forms on Earth to the largest stellar objects is made almost entirely of matter. Yeah. There's not much antimatter to be found. Hmm. Something must have happened to tip the balance. What happened to the antimatter? Why are we seeing asymmetry between matter and antimatter? Matter and antimatter particles are always produced as a pair, and if they come in contact, annihilate one another. During the first fractions of a second of the Big Bang, the hot and dense universe was buzzing with particle-antiparticle pairs popping in and out of existence. Hmm, they sound pretty sure of what happened at this Big Bang that's theoretical. Anyway, they go on to say that a tiny portion of matter, about one particle per billion, managed to survive, and this is what we see today. And in the past few decades, particle physics experiments have shown that the laws of nature do not apply equally to matter and antimatter. And then get this. Some unknown entity intervening in this process in the early universe could have caused these oscillating particles to decay as matter more often than they decayed as antimatter. Some unknown entity, you guys. Who could it be that wanted there to be matter rather than antimatter? <laughs> they say, consider a coin spinning on a table. It cannot be defined as heads or tails until it stops spinning and falls to one side and has a 50-50 chance of landing on its head or its tail. And in the same way, half of the oscillating particles in the early universe should have decayed as matter and the other half as antimatter? I vehemently disagree. <laughs> anyway, 
Studying this imbalance could help scientists paint a clearer picture of why the universe is matter-filled. Because, yeah, I'm always asking myself that. Where's all the antimatter, you guys? Goodness gracious. I just, there's just so little of it in the world. We need more <laughs> so that it can annihilate all the matter. That's all that matters. <laughs> I'm sorry. So I'll do another few videos explaining about antimatter and what, what it's creating and how it's changing physics. They actually call it new physics. Right now, I want to talk about retrocausality. I just wanted to show you that antimatter indeed is being handled, created, stored, and other things at CERN. And remember I told you about the first proton-proton collision? Way back in 1971 when they used to do collisions with matter and not antimatter. <laughs> Here is a video that was titled CERN's first proton-proton collisions, which obviously they didn't know about the 1971 thing, but I want you to take a look at how excited these people are. It's almost as if in 2010, this was groundbreaking new things to smash these particles together. Now welcome to the CERN Control Center. Bonjour. We may discover uh, additional forces where we may discover additional space dimension, the Higgs boson, we may elucidate uh, the, uh, the the mystery and the origin of the universe that matter. And who knows, perhaps nature has, has prepared some, uh, some nice surprises. And here on the screen we can see the four different experiments, ATLAS, CMS, LHCB and ALICE. And the program for today is to first send one beam in one direction, a second beam in the opposite direction. So, one there, one here, and one over there. So, okay, we're both beams at 3.5 TV, and we've just uh, collapsed the separation bumps and brought the beams into collision. Two beams, one in blue, one in red. They have to get closer and closer. When the numbers on the four readers say zero, this is the historical moment we were all expecting. I don't know if you noticed all the posters around that said first physics on it. And this is supposedly in 2010, which is weird to me because I remember it being 2008 when CERN first turned on. But that's what's wild about retro causality. Like this movie supposedly from the 60s looks like it's the 80s, but she's got a cell phone, clearly. So before I unload all of the LEP stuff from the 80s that I have put together about CERN, I want to just make one more point about the video that we just watched. I just think to myself, if you imagine like Thomas Edison like inventing the light bulb, if he had tried to invent the light bulb with like a hundred camera crews in yeah. his workshop. <laughs> Thomas Edison did not invent the light bulb, but on almost every publication of him, it is taught to us that he did. And here, she's comparing this event at CERN in 2010 to the invention of the light bulb. So it's a new thing. I think it's the quantum infiltration at work. Anywho, I'm gonna let you enjoy now this video compilation I've put together of the LEP. So this is uh, some footage from CERN, obviously from 1989. It's about Opal, which is one of the four detectors that was on the LEP, which is the Large Electron-Positron Collider that was the precursor to the LHC. CERN's Large Electron-Positron Collider, commonly called LEP, is a large accelerator 27 kilometers in circumference to cause electrons and positrons to collide head-on. The materialized energy liberated by such collisions will bring about new particles. Right, so this is important. They're making new particles. They're creating matter and antimatter. The low mass of the particles is compensated by the large radius of the ring. 20 kilometers of the accelerator, installed in an underground tunnel at a depth of 148 meters, lie under French territory and 6.7 kilometers under Switzerland. The orbit is not actually circular, but made up of alternate arcs and straight sections. There are in total eight arcs with a radius of curvature of 3.1 kilometers and eight straight sections of about 300 meters each. In four of them are the areas where the experimental detectors are installed. That of L3 at point two, Aleph at point four, Opal at point six, and Delphi at point eight. This is an old illustration of the LEP and where the L3 is and where Delphi is 
are now ALIS and the LHCB, but ATLAS and the CMS experiment are in different places than the original ALIF and OPAL experiments were at the time. Four bunches of electrons travel anti-clockwise, and four bunches of positrons travel clockwise inside the high vacuum tube. Particles are accelerated by means of 128 radio frequency cavities. The circular orbit is maintained by 3,000 dipole magnets, each of them producing a magnetic field of 0.135 Tesla. The beams are focused by 760 quadrupoles and 520 sextupoles. Quadrupoles and sextupoles are huge magnets that focus the beam energy into one place. The eight bunches collide every 22.4 microseconds. Okay, so eight bunches times 22.4 four microseconds is a lot of bunches every second and how many are in a bunch billions of particles are present in each bunch this is leps challenge circular accelerator a hundred meters below ground this microscope is the cern accelerator equipped with four detectors which continually analyze the collision of particles. By 1983, the tunnel had been dug at a depth of 100 meters. 27 kilometers of tunnel with four giant halls to house the detectors and to guarantee the success of the project in the installation of a small suspended train to ferry the various pieces of equipment. A veritable subway with underground halls to house the detectors. I had never heard of the train monorail system, but Apparently this is footage right here from 2016 and it's taken from Tim, the train inspection monorail for the LHC. And as you can see, it's an autonomous vehicle that follows predefined missions. And you can see it up at the top there blinking and it rides the rails of what used to be used as a train for loading in big, huge pieces of equipment. And it's equipped with radio protection probe for radiation mapping of the LHC. I had trouble finding anything about the train monorail system in the LEP because it took me to the Gothard Tunnel opening. How does the accelerator work? In a circle, 27 kilometers in circumference, electrons and positrons grouped in bunches are accelerated in a vacuum speed close to that of light. I thought the speed of light wasn't a constant. Am I wrong about that? 300,000 kilometers per second. Four red bunches, positrons, traveling in one direction, and four blue bunches, electrons, in the other direction. But their small size and the vacuum surrounding them does not ensure a 100% collision. That's why inside the tube, very powerful magnets concentrate the flux before it enters the detector. Thousands of collisions in the four giant detectors, which are capable of recording in real time the trajectories and identities of the secondary particles emitted at the moment of interaction. The bunches of electrons and positrons also collide outside the detector. There's really no way of controlling the collisions that happen outside of the detectors. Today, the accelerator is twice as powerful as it was in the beginning. To double the energy capacity of the accelerator, more powerful acceleration cavities have been installed. The device must be maintained at a constant temperature of minus 269 degrees Celsius. Interestingly, the coldest places on Earth are in labs. It's minus 273.15 degrees Celsius, which is what they think is the coldest possible temperature. Minus 269 degrees Celsius is temperature at which helium turns from a gas to a liquid, but it happens to be the average temperature of the universe they found out when they were trying to figure out why radios had static. That's why the cavities are sealed in a tube filled with liquid helium. The LEP's performance has been doubled. In the first operating phase, commonly called LEP-1 and scheduled for July 1989, electrons and positrons will be accelerated up to 50 GeV per beam. I just want to point out that some people might try to say that 50 GeV per beam, that's a little collider, that's hardly a collision, but I think it's a principle of we're messing with matter. Any collision is a collision of particles, breaks them apart into all pieces. And like that one dude said in Jurassic Park, we're messing with things that are against nature. How can we possibly know what to expect? High intensity electrons and positron beams will be accelerated to reach a high luminosity, in other words, a high number of collisions, to produce within a year about a million intermediate Z0 bosons. Searches will be made in the decay products for the existence of particles which have never been observed, like the Higgs boson and the top quark. Have you ever wondered how they knew about those particles and had them named before they were ever even discovered? That's retrocausality. LEP-1 could make it possible to discover new phenomena never seen with existing facilities. Aha! Did you catch that? Existing facilities? There were already lots of CERN-like places sprouted up everywhere.
all over the world, and this was February 1989. A subsequent phase, LEP2, is scheduled for 1993 to 1994. This will facilitate a detailed study of the production of W plus W minus pairs. Opal is the detector located at interaction point six, built by a group of 24 institutes in Europe, Canada, Israel, Japan, and the United States. And all those aforementioned places, by the way, have particle colliders at this time in the 80s as well. Major engineering work has been done by European firms in France, Germany, the Netherlands, Italy, Spain, Switzerland, United Kingdom, Canada, and Japan. Opal consists of a series of concentric detectors, which can be divided into three independent sections. One, the barrel, and two symmetrical sections. From the center of the detector to the outside, there are the central detector surrounding the vacuum chamber, a magnet in the form of a solenoid, a scintillator array constituting the time of flight detector, an electromagnetic calorimeter, a hadron calorimeter, finally a set of drift chambers to detect muons, the only particles capable of passing through dense materials forming the innermost detector components. The detector is surrounded by six groups of huts housing the sets of electronics connected to the opal detector and capable of moving with it on special rails are known as rucksacks. Forgive me if I'm wrong about this, but I thought that rucksacks were... never mind. The central detector consists of three distinct parts, the vertex detector and the jet and Z chambers. The vertex detector provides accurate measurements of the trajectory of electrically charged particles. The jet chambers detect the trajectory and momentum of particles housed in a supporting structure consisting of a hollow cylinder. This structure is subdivided into 24 identical sectors, each containing 160 wires alternating with 161 earthed wire. The former are sensitive to signals, the latter field wires give the electric field a symmetrical shape. Jet chambers operate with a gas mixture, 88% argon, 9.4% methane, and 2.6% isobutane. As the particles cross the chamber, they generate ionization, which, when analyzed, identify ionizing particles. This chamber gives a spatial resolution of at least 150 micrometers. <laughs> we gotta listen again. He goes, at least 150 micrometers. <laughs> at least 150 micrometers. <laughs> One more time. Of at least 150 micrometers. Around the central detector, there is an aluminium coil to provide a uniform magnetic field of 0.4 Tesla. This coil consumes 5 megawatts of power at 700 volts and thus requires continuous cooling with water. For the LEP2 phase, it is intended to replace the conventional magnetic solenoid by a superconducting coil capable of producing a magnetic field of 1 Tesla. The powerful and large magnetic field bends the trajectory of the particle from which it is possible to determine their momentum and charge to establish their mass. But at the beginning, if you remember, they said that they can't wait to make these new particles and discover the secrets of the universe. Immediately outside the coil is the time of flight detector, consisting of an array of 160 scintillators. A scintillator just helps to amplify the light that's emitted. It fluoresces when it's hit by charged particles. Laid on a cylindrical surface with an outside diameter slightly larger than that of the coil. So if you'll notice these detectors, they're old fashioned. They are precursors to like CMS. They're not using solenoid, they're using metal. So they're measuring by the amount of electromagnetic radiation or light emitted. So my question is, were they really detecting much or was it just for the collisions so they could get that decay that some speculate this decay has brought in things from another dimension? Photo multipliers at each end of the scintillators to detect the light of the particles propagated in the scintillator. Oh yeah, by the way, I've wondered if these photomultipliers are actually multiplying or actually amplifying this signal so that they can get more decay from the collisions and let more dark matter, dark energy, slash entities, what have you, in. The precision of more than a nanosecond, these measurements will make it possible to determine the velocity and mass of the incident particles for energies up to a few GeV. Then there is a pre-sampler system consisting of two layers of limited streamer tubes containing argon, carbon dioxide, and n-pentane. It is designed to pre-sample both the electromagnetic and the hadron shower, thus improving the energy resolution. Among the components of Opal, the electromagnetic calorimeter identifies electrons and photons and measures their energy. In Opal, it consists of a cylindrical part, the barrel, fitted outside the pre-sampler, and two end caps arranged at the end of the central detector. The radius of the external end caps, which also have have an annular structure is 3.2 meters. Here, the seven layers of iron plates, 10 centimeters thick and spaced 3.5 centimeters apart, alternate with limited streamer tube layers. The signals are analyzed via electrodes in the shape of pads and strips located on the chambers. 
The pads are 50 by 50 centimeter copper foils in a pyramidal array pointing towards the interaction center intended to measure the charge liberated by ionization from particles passing through the material. The signals induced on the pads of the same array are collected by a special circuit which provides readings proportional to the total energy released. The four millimeter aluminum strips make it possible to record individual signals. After discrimination, they will show whether or not a strip has been struck and thus make it possible to reconstruct the track of the charged particle. In the outermost part of Opal is the muon detector, also consisting of a barrel and two end caps. Passing through the internal components, the muons, the final products of the electromagnetic interaction, are detected by four drift chamber planes located in the barrel. Each chamber has a single wire parallel to the beam. The two end caps which complete the solid angle cover consist of two planes, each made up of two limited shower chamber layers. The crossed strips fitted on the chambers provide information on the spatial direction followed by the particles during their travel. The forward detector identifies and measures the energy of the electrons emitted at a narrow angle to the beam direction. It consists of two identical cylindrical units, one at each end of the detector. From the inside to the outside, each of these modules contains two wire chambers, four pairs of scintillators, a pre-radiator, and a cylindrical electromagnetic calorimeter fitted around the vacuum chamber. The chambers facilitate a clear extrapolation of the tracks from the interaction point. The scintillators are essentially used to monitor the luminosity, while the calorimeter, in which lead discs alternate with scintillating material, provide the total angular cover essential for the identification of photons and electrons. The opal detector substantially consists of a large cylinder weighing 3,000 tons and measuring about 10 meters in diameter and about 11 meters in length. Its design and construction took years of hard work. The letter of intent for the experiment was submitted in January 1982 and the proposal was discussed by the LEP Experiments Committee in March of that year, while data taking is scheduled for the second half of 1989. Okay, can we talk about this? Who says scheduled? Like, <laughs> what is that? The dimensions and complexity of the detector, the structure of whose individual components has just been described in detail, are perfectly suitable for today's need in high energy physics for ever more sophisticated instruments to meet the ever greater number of unanswered questions we have on the infinitely small in the hope of being able to understand the origins of the universe. Well, that's it for this time, guys. Thank you very much for watching. And please feel free to like subscribe share and comment let's talk about these things but i needed to put some dancing <laughs> at the end of this heavy heavy stuff because retro causality freaks me out <laughs> and it should freak you out too if you're human you'll be freaked out by it because <laughs> it's just not right anyway much love to everybody and i'm gonna let the dancers take you out yeah